The following interview was conducted with Tom Hayworth, Human Resources Administrator, Purdue University Libraries. For the Purdue University Oral History Program, it took place on Wednesday, February 10th, 2010, in Stewart Center, uh, 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome, Tom, and good afternoon to you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Appreciate your asking me to do this. Thank you. Okay, let's. It's quite an honor, as far as I'm my concerned. My pleasure. Tell us where and when you were born, and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, let's see. I was born uh, about 60 miles north of here. I was born in Rochester, Indiana on uh, December 2nd, 1943. I was uh, born a twin. My twin didn't live uh, to adulthood, but I come from a family of four boys. My parents had myself. Uh, I have two older brothers. There was myself and my twin, and then I have a younger brother. And So I come from a family of all boys. Um, I was born, like I say, in 1943 in Rochester, Indiana. Both of my parents were uh, from Attica, Indiana. I had all my relatives, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles were all down in Attica, Indiana. But I was born in Rochester, Indiana. Um, what was, where did you go to school? Uh, I, I went to um, elementary school uh, in Rochester, Indiana, and then I went to junior high and high school in Rochester, Indiana. And then upon... Uh, Tell us about high school, any student clubs? Oh, uh, yeah, like yeah, I was, I, was, I was very active in high school. I was uh, uh, very active in clubs. I was in, uh, um, oh God, that goes back a ways. I, I, for the four years that I was in high school, I was the class vice president for two years, and I was the class, my class president for two years. My junior and senior year was when I was the class president. I was involved in uh, um, uh, some sports. I played tennis. I was on the high school tennis team. I didn't play any basketball or football because my father would not allow any of his sons to play those full contact sports because he didn't want any of us to get injured. So I figured I'd go for tennis, and I absolutely love tennis. And I played tennis into my young adulthood. I've enjoyed that, and maybe when I retire, Hopefully, maybe I'm going to get back out on the courts and see if I can still get the ball across the net. We're going to see if I can do that. Um, so I was in, um, trying to remember, high school goes back a ways. Uh, what was the size of your class, do you remember? Um, the size of my class probably was, I want to say, around 90-some-odd students. There were probably 90 students in my, in my graduating senior class. And I still stay in contact with them. We have... Uh, what do you call that? Um, a reunion? A reunion's coming up. In fact, it's not going to be very long before I'll have my 60th reunion, and we've had class reunions about every five to ten years, and I still get invitations to them, and I go to those in my hometown. My class, of course, has dwindled considerably over the years, and uh, it's amazing, though, to see all these people and to recall all the fun times we had. And... Um, like I say, I was in high school during the 60s, and that was kind of a turbulent time, and, but we all managed to uh, pull together, and we had a lot of fun as, as, a, as a class. We sure. did a lot of things together. Any teacher that you recall that, to, uh, that you had? What sort of course were you taking? Uh, you I, I took the uh, college, prep uh, college prep course, yeah, because I, I, only because I, I hadn't even thought of going to college in high school until probably my junior or senior year. And... The, uh, so I took a college prep course with lots, a lot of math courses, science, and then the humanities and all that stuff. Um, uh, as far as a teacher, favorite teacher I had, I would probably say that uh, my favorite teacher was uh, a guy by the name of Deverell Becker. He was a math and chemistry pro uh, teacher. He, math and chemistry have always kind of come hard for me, but he was the kind of teacher that was would sit down with you and would explain it in great detail and so I really had no trouble with math after a meeting with him on several occasions and once I got past a few bumps in chemistry I absolutely loved chemistry mm -hmm. I to this day I still look back fondly on those days in that chemistry course sure okay then after you graduated what did what came next after I graduated I uh, worked that summer my father was a contractor and so I worked for him uh, and a couple, working with a team of guys that uh, put roofs on houses and laid concrete sidewalks. And I remember that summer specifically because 
my uh, parents or my my grandparents had properties here in the West Lafayette area, and um, there's a place over on Lincoln and Robinson that has uh, several houses, and a, I believe there's a used to be a, a village pantry in there and a filling station. I don't know what's. I think there's a, a real estate office in that location now. That those four or five plots over there on the city uh, maps is called the Hayworth edition. So there is a Hayworth edition on the west side in West Lafayette. And I remember distinctly breaking up the old sidewalks with uh, with equipment and laying con new concrete sidewalks there back in the 1960s when I graduated from high school. That's awesome. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, did, well, then go ahead. Then what came next? Did oh, then, the, then I decided, I had decided to go to Ball State because I thought maybe I wanted to be a teacher. And I studied, I majored in, uh, well, I was in education. I majored in English and had a double major in psychology. And I went to Ball State for four years. I did my student teaching up in uh, Argus, Indiana. And after my student teaching experience up there, I decided that teaching was not really what I wanted to get into. So I graduated from uh, Ball State with a degree. Uh, I forget what the, it was a bachelor's de Bachelor of Arts degree, but, uh, but my major was psychology and English. And I thought at that time that I really wanted to kind of pursue the psychology part of my educational background. So I applied for a job at the Logan Sports State Mental Hospital they had interviews on campus there, there, and I remember being interviewed in my dormitory by a gentleman whose name I can't remember. He came from the uh, Logan Sports State Mental Hospital, and he liked me, I guess, so he hired me, and I was hired as an industrial work therapist on a special project that was going on at the time at the Logan Sports State Mental Hospital where they had certain selected groups of, of their mental patients in a specific ward and they were trying to rehabilitate them through work therapy sessions where they would try to get them out into the community uh, there in, in Logansport, Indiana to, uh, to do a work outside of the hospital to hope, hopefully rehabilitate them. And I worked in that job for um, probably about a year or so after I graduated from college and then I was immediately uh, drafted into the United States Army in 1966, and I had to leave uh, in this, I never will forget this, in December uh, 4th of 1966, I remember getting on a bus in my hometown and heading down to the Armed Forces Entrance and Examining Station in Indianapolis, got down there and went through all the tests, took the physical, took the written tests, and since it was so close to Christmas, they decided that they wouldn't take me into the Army until after Christmas, so they sent me home. So I had been drafted into the Army for one day, and they sent me home, and I thought, I really like this. I don't mind this kind of an environment at all. But then in January, I had to report back down to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I took my basic training, uh, and then uh, my advanced individual training was an additional 12 weeks beyond the basic training, and I took that down there in Fort Knox. I was, because of my test scores, I guess, they had me in the uh, uh, supervisory management group, whatever, as opposed to being a frontline infantryman. They pulled me out of the, uh, out of the mix and, and sent me to personnel school uh, there at Fort Knox. And I was made a, uh, uh, a supervisor. I had my own platoon of men. I had about 30 uh, soldiers that I was responsible for making sure that they were working and that they were uh, doing what they were supposed to be doing. And I remember I had a private room in this very plush dormitory down there. And so I thought, my God, military life is beautiful. Uh, the room down there was nicer than the dormitory room I had in at Ball State. And so I really liked that. So I was a platoon leader there during, uh, during the time that I was in uh, training at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And then after that, I got out of that and they sent me on order down to Fort Hood, Texas where I was shipped uh, down there for the remaining year and a half of my military uh, obligation and they pulled me out of the line down there and stuck me into um, an office there that processed uh, soldiers out of the military and uh, my responsibility and the gentleman that, that was my boss at the time 
were responsible for uh, interviewing and doing all the paperwork to uh, uh, what's the word I want to out outsource or to um, discharge a lot of the uh, dishonorable discharges and the general discharges and the hardship discharges that uh, the military had at the time as opposed to the honorable discharges. I handled all of the undesirable and the general discharges, the sole surviving sons, the, the, the fellows that were confined to, the, um, uh, to jail down there. They would send them over to my office under guard. I always required that they have the MPs, the military police, escort them over to my office, and then I would interview them and do the paperwork, and then take the paperwork up to the exchange office, and they, they would then be discharged un with undesirable discharges from the military. And I did that for about a year and a half down in Fort Hood, Texas. Oh, wow. Not a pleasant, not a pleasant thing. It was not a pleasant thing, but I absolutely enjoyed it. I loved, right. I loved the variety. Um, I was never, uh, it was never traumatic in any way, shape, or fashion, but it was, it was better than some of the stories I heard from some of the infantrymen that were coming back from Vietnam because I did help. When my work in my office was kind of down, I would go downstairs and help process the boys that were coming back from Vietnam, process them out of the military, and there was a, I never will forget the interviews that I had with some of those kids down there and some of the things that they'd seen while they were over in Vietnam, and I, I consider myself indeed fortunate that I stayed, that I was able to stay state stateside and um, during that time. During that time. Okay. Then after you got discharged, then you got discharged from down there. Yes, I okay. got discharged from Fort Hood, Texas. Okay, and then what? Uh, what was the next step on your career path? Then uh, I decided that I liked personnel work, and so I went back to the before I got discharged from the army. I contacted the Ball State University Placement Office and told them that I was, since I was one of their graduates and that was a service that they provided to me for free, I told them that I was leaving the military and I was interested in knowing what, if any, job opportunities there were in personnel work within the state of Indiana. And I immediately I got a call from uh, some placement counselor uh, while I was even in the military, about two weeks before I was discharged telling me they wanted to interview me at Ball State for uh, some possible jobs that was going on in the Fort Wayne area. So when I got out of the military, I contacted the placement office and they told me, they directed me over to Fort Wayne, Indiana to a company called Indiana and Michigan Electric Company. They had a job opening for a personnel assistant in their corporate offices there on Spy Run Avenue in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And so I drove from my hometown of Rochester 60 miles East over to Fort Wayne, interviewed there at Indiana and Michigan uh, in their in their headquarter personnel office with a gentleman by the name of Hugh Wilmore, who I consider to be one of the nicest guys and the best boss I ever had in my entire life. Um, I interviewed with him and he liked me, so he hired me as a personnel assistant there in his office, and I started like maybe two or three weeks later. I moved over to Fort Wayne, Indiana, got an apartment over there, lived like maybe a mile away from the work site and went back and forth to work. And uh, <coughs> my job was mostly working there in the office conducting, doing wage and salary audits where we had to write job descriptions and had to evaluate job descriptions. Um, I also did a little labor relations. Uh, Indiana and Michigan Electric Company was a labor that was it was it was a little company that had labor unions and so every s several years they had to update their union contracts and that meant actually getting out and getting on the road driving to the various locations in Indiana down in southern Indiana and in northern Indiana and setting in on the contra union contract negotiations keeping notes and writing and rewriting contracts and so I can remember spending many nights in many motels, staying up till midnight many times with my boss, writing and rewriting language in union contracts that the union would find acceptable, and setting in on union negotiations where the discussions got kind of heated and there were a lot of arguments and a lot of name calling and all that stuff. And I remember those days, I remember thinking, I do not want to spend the rest of my life in labor relations. It's not, it's not my idea of a fun time. 
and that's a big challenge. It's like a uh, tennis thing. It's back and forth, you know. <laughs> that's over correct. Over the net, you know. That's correct. Just say one says, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I worked for Indiana, Michigan Electric Company for three, I can't remember, three or four years. And then they had a little bit of a downturn. And they wanted to uh, transfer me to one of their smaller divisions in southern Indiana, some little town in southern Indiana. And I was not particularly enamored of going back to a little hicky small town and spending the rest of my life in a little burg down in southern Indiana. So at that time I decided I wanted to look for something else. So I went back to my Ball State placement office who served me in good stead the first time and they told me there was a personnel offering opening in National Homes Corporation in Lafayette, Indiana. And so I contacted the recruiter there. His name was Mike Miller and he wanted me to come down to La Lafayette and interview with him, and I did that. Came down here and interviewed in Lafayette, and he liked me, and he hired me. Uh, this would have been in probably in 1972. I probably would have been, I came to the Lafayette, West Lafayette area in 1972, and I was hired as a supervisor of wages, benefits, and records administration for National Homes Corporation. Where were they located? They were located on uh, Earl Avenue okay. at... Uh, 501 Earl Avenue. I never will forget that address because it's the same address as Free Hafer Hall, 501. So it was 501 Earl Avenue. That was their corporate offices with the, the Price family. Jim and George Price owned that company. And it was a, it was a public company and, and lots, the, lots of shareholders. The corporate headquarters were here in The corporate headquarters were here in Lafayette. And the National Homes Corporation had many, many different kinds of businesses. They had their they had National Homes Acceptance Corporation, which is a huge mortgage banking concern. So they did all of their mortgage lending through that in National Homes Corporation, or National Homes Acceptance Corporation. They had National Homes Corporation, which was the home building wing of their company. They had National Mobile Homes, which owned about 12 to 15 mobile home plants scattered all across the continental United States, all the way from New York to California, from uh, Michigan all the way down to Texas. And uh, they had a resort community uh, outside of Austin, Texas called Lago Vista where they were developing uh, housing addition, expensive housing additions down there around this lake. And so I, in my capacity, it was my responsibility to travel to all of these locations uh, and conduct job audits to write job descriptions at the different locations and come and do uh, salary surveys, wage surveys for the local areas. So I would go to all of these places, sit down, interview all the staff, write job descriptions, mm -hmm. talk to uh, the people, try to get some salary surveys from the local area. Then I would come back and, and uh, write, finish up the job descriptions, and then I would make a recommendation to my boss about what the salary scale should be for that specific area that I had just been to. Mm -hmm. um, I did that for several years and then National Homes started having a downturn. They lost, they were uh, in severe straits financially and the economy, that was, n was not doing good. Oh, what year would that have been? That would have been probably about 1974, 1975. Okay. And um, I remember at the time they had a lot of layoffs. They laid off my boss and they laid off my boss's boss and gave their jobs to me and expected me to do basically three jobs in addition to all the traveling that I was doing. And I just got fed up and told them I just didn't want to do that anymore. I basically got burned out. And so I left National Homes in the spring of 1975. Fortunately, I'd had, I had had enough money that I f didn't have to go out and find a job immediately. And I thought, I'm going to take the summer off. So that was the summer of 1975 that I took off from National Homes. And I got on my exercise kick and I lost 50 pounds. I started a running regimen and I lost, I decided I wanted to get back to being a little bit more healthy than I was when I was working at National Homes. So I started running, lost 50 pounds. And then in the August of 1975, I decided it was probably time to go back to work. So I had a friend down at the Indiana Employment Security Office, um, and she told me, she said, why don't you check with Purdue University? Purdue is always hiring. 
So I made an appointment with an interviewer over in Freehafer Hall in 1975. They had an opening for an assistant employment manager, is what they called it. I applied for that. I got that job. I was hired by my current friend, Marcia Brown, who was the employment manager at the time. She hired me in as her assistant employment manager, and I started at Purdue in August of 1975. And about two, at that time, the business office of Purdue University was undergoing, all of their job descriptions were undergoing a review, and I was hired in as the assistant employment manager, and then they finally, through the Hayes study, decided that that was a, a, a bogus job title, so they changed my job title to human resources specialist or something along that line. So all of a sudden I was demoted and I'd only been at Purdue for like a, a month or two, but that didn't bother me. I enjoyed my work down there. I worked many times morning, mornings, evenings, and weekends trying to keep up with the flow of applicant flow to, to, to administrative professional jobs on campus. At that time there were only three of us interviewers. There was one lady by the name of Melinda Bain who was the service interviewer. Melinda is now working as an administrative assistant to the vice president and treasurer, so she, and she's still on campus. Uh, she handled at that time the service interviewers, service interviews, mostly for physical plant. I handled the interviews for the administrative professional openings on campus, and Marcia Allen was another interviewer who did all the clerical recruiting and interviewing on campus. At that time, there were three of us. And now I think there's probably six or seven recruiters down there doing the same work that the three of us did back in the 1970s. Although I'm sure that the, the uh, job openings and the size of the university has changed significantly since the 1970s. So that's my, and then in 1978, uh, an opening, a friend of mine uh, was leaving the library's human resources office and he asked me, he said, Tom, would you be interested in applying for my job? And I did. And I applied for that in 1978. Came over here, was interviewed by uh, an assistant director by the name of Miriam Drake, Mimi Drake. And uh, there were several people on the search committee. I was the only applicant that applied at the time. And so I guess it was kind of a shoe in They had nobody else to hire but me, so they hired me in August of 1978. And I've been in this position since August of, well, it, is, it, it morphed. Uh, in the 1980s, Carolyn Dexter and I also were asked to be the personnel office for another division located here in Stewart Center called the Instructional Center for Instructional Services, which included continuing education and conferences. It included the photographic services, all the old audiovisual services that the libraries used to uh, used to be part of the libraries. The computing center; those areas were all in my area of responsibilities in addition to all of the libraries. And Carolyn and I did that work and worked for them and helped them get their organization staffed and up to snuff and going and handled all the wage and salary and the employee relations issues with them and the job descriptions. And we did that for 20 years up to uh, probably sometime around 2000 or thereabouts. Let me ask you, at that time when you came, Audiovisual Center was no longer under the libraries? When I, when I came here in 1978, for about a, about a year, about two years, the, audio, it, the, organi the organization was called the LAVC, right. Libraries Audiovisual Center. Okay. And the Audiovisual Center was, was part of the uh, libraries organization at that time. Joe Dignese was the director of the Libraries and Audiovisual Center. A gentleman by the name of David Moses was the director of the Audiovisual Center. And um, and it wasn't until the new undergraduate library was built out in the front yard of Stewart Center that... That would have been 1982. Well, that would have been 82, so that would have been the time that the Audiovisual Center was then separated from from the libraries. and Because many of the staff from the Audiovisual Center went out to work in the undergraduate library, and the remaining, the people that remained behind were made part of the Center for Instructional Services. Right. Okay. Except a couple came to the library, like Carl Snow. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. yeah. And um, Carl Stafford, but he was sort of quasi. But well, Carl, Carl, St Carl Stafford stayed with the Center for Instructional and Services. John and, and John Wilhusen. And John Wilhusen stayed, uh, stayed with the libraries, and Carl Snow stayed with, with the undergraduate library. Carl Snow went to the undergraduate library, as did John, yeah, John, John Wilhusen. 
Yes, he went with the undergraduate that's library. Right, that's right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Had to stop and think. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Now you're <coughs> at the library. Let's talk about some responsibilities and the challenges and in position descriptions. You did a lot with that. Oh, I. Um, Was there a major change uh, right in at that time? Because yeah. I know over time. Uh, yeah, maybe that was after the member years ago. We used to have the junior professional, but that took place before that, you that had that before, Yeah, right. there, yeah, there was a classification of junior professional uh, that was a, a classification before I arrived at the libraries. When I arrived at the libraries, there was only like one or two junior professionals, individuals left. They weren't called junior professionals. I think uh, and, um, down in reference, uh, Betty Jones. Betty Jones was the last of the right. of the uh, junior professionals. Yeah, I was aware of that classification. When I came here, and I think at that time we had about, I want to say there was about 140 clerical jobs. There was maybe 10 or 11 service jobs because we had shelvers at that time. And I think we had probably 40 to 50 faculty and administrative professional openings. And then at that time we had about a little over 100 students, workers that worked for us. And there's been a major shift in the staffing since that time. We're now down to probably a little over 100 clerical staff. We, pro we don't have shelvers anymore because those shelving duties are, were relegated to student employees. Um, we probably have maybe four or five uh, service employees. We have maybe close to 60, I forget the exact number, 60 or 65 faculty and administrative professional now. And the, our biggest uh, jump in em employment has been in the student ranks. When I came here, we had like 100 student employees. They were all non-work-study students. And now we're up close to over 200, maybe 250 student workers, and the majority of those are work-study students. So our staff has discovered that by hiring work-study students, they could increase the number of, of students that they have working for them and still stay within their respective budgets. Right. One difference between ours and Freehaver when you were down there, you were not involved in any of the student recruitment. That was that's, always separate. Whereas here, you are. Yeah, here, the yeah. Is, right? Yeah, two times a year, mostly like the week or two before the beginning of the semester in August, and then maybe for a week or so in January. Um, the Human Resources Office is pretty deeply involved, was pretty deeply involved in hiring students. Uh, Carolyn Dexter and I, for many years, would spend an entire week doing nothing but hiring students. Uh, now, with our budget situation being the way it is, we've kind of curtailed some of the student hiring, so I don't anticipate there's going to have, have the great volume of student hiring that we've had in past years until, until the budget situation changes. Sure, that's right. Uh, let's talk about faculty and the uh, search committee process, okay. that, which was when you came on board was fairly new for the university, but was in place, but it's, there have been a lot of changes since then. Yeah, the, um, uh, when I came here, the, well, and it's still this way, there uh, librarians, I, I came at a time when there was a, a little bit of a shift. Uh, most, of the, most of the librarians that were here had faculty rank and status, and it's one juncture point there, and I can't remember the exact date, certain elements of the library's faculty wanted to opt out of faculty status, and they had to make a plea to the vice president and the director of libraries and the vice president must have made the decision that certain uh, librarians, uh, staff with MLS degrees, were uh, no longer going to be considered to have faculty rank and status, while most of our public service librarians still retain that. So at that time we had kind of a dual, dual appointment process going on and I remember I was deeply involved in that because we had to decide the ones that were not faculty how were they were going to be classified we had to do job descriptions for them which we did and they were uh, they were made top level administrative professional top level professional classification in Purdue schema things and that that still persists to this day but um, yeah, when I came here, most of the librarians were, were faculty, but there was a, a few jobs that split off. Jobs in technical services, ITD, those were the areas that, that split off from faculty status back in the, in that, at that period of time. Uh, I don't, again, like I say, I don't remember the exact date. But approximately, but, like that, I remember was that. Was that approximately in the late 70s, early there. 80s? Yeah, you're, you're in the ballpark Something on that. like that. Right. Yeah. 
there were a few that grandfathered in. One, of course, was Bill Perret. That's correct. Yeah, so that's like correct. Like all things, there's always those that are there on board can always grandfather. That's correct. Another end. That's um, correct. Um, what about uh, who's, who sets up the uh, search committees? Um, that's that's a fun process. Uh, it's uh, the uh, dean or uh, the dean in this case the dean now or back then the director would make the decision uh, with the administrative committee that there was a need to fill a faculty appointment if if one of our faculty members uh, retired or resigned or had moved on that decision would come from the of the highest levels of administration and uh, a search committee would be appointed with a chair and then it was a responsibility of the chair of the search committee and the committee to draft a position description, a notice of vacancy, because we do not have job descriptions on this campus for faculty appointments. The only job descriptions that the university maintains are for clerical and service and for administrative professional. But um, So search committees would develop a notice of vacancy. They would decide uh, when they wanted, uh, where they wanted to advertise, when they wanted to screen candidates for s the positions and what the deadline dates were going to be. And they would communicate all that information to my office, and then it would be my responsibility and the person helping me at that time to ensure that uh, we did all the necessary EEO and affirmative action paperwork that was required through the, through the then affirmative action office. We had to get faculty searches approved through the affirmative action office, and we had to tell them we had to write the notice of vacancy and we had to tell them where we were advertising and what kind of efforts we were trying to follow to recruit minorities into, into library openings, library faculty openings. And the libraries has always had goals for minorities and the libraries has always had goals for female faculty members. Those were our historically two predominantly targeted areas for affirmative action goals for the libraries were minorities and females. And we've always done very good with, with the hiring of female uh, uh, faculty members. Where we've, I remember at one point in time, many years ago, we did have all of our affirmative action goals met. Where we did have, um, we had a Hispanic librarian, we had a, uh, an Asian Pacific Islander librarian, we had a black librarian, we had an American Indian librarian all working here at the same time for a very short period of time and I remember the director Paul Bayless who was head of the affirmative action office at that time was complimenting the director of libraries Joe Dinesi and I he said Joe he says you and Tom have a full house right about now I never will forget that comment and that was the one and only time when we've had probably all the of our minority positions filled um, but so my office was responsible for placing the ads, which was very relatively easy to do. Uh, we would serve as the central screening point. The ads, the applicants would apply to uh, the Human Resources Office. We would make sure that the committee members received copies of the applications. And then and in my role as HR administrator, I set in on every uh, faculty search meeting to make sure that all questions were answered and that I knew what they were doing. and and that I could do the work that whatever the search committee directed me to do. And everything from placing the ads to working with all of the applicants to sending out acknowledgement letters to, to uh, setting up itineraries for applicants to visit with us on campus to uh, driving them to the airport to taking them out to, to lunch or dinner, which I did on very rare occasions. Um, Escorting, them, escorting around. them around, making sure that they made it to their uh, right. pointed places on the itinerary. Uh, yeah, that was my responsibility as it related to faculty hirings. And we did hire, I can't, numerous faculty within the last 20 some odd right. year period. About, uh, you gave them some assistance with relocation. They would touch base with that, you. That's right, right. yeah. I, I, I haven't done that in recent years, but yeah. occasionally when, when we would hire a new faculty member or something, I would. Uh, they would say they're going to visit the area and I would get in my car and I would get them and their spouse and their child, if, if applicable, get in my car and I would drive them around to different areas around the West Lafayette uh, community and in the Lafayette community trying to help them find what kind of housing they were looking for. And that usually, I always made it um, kind of a, a game and I remember, uh, I always like to say that 
it wouldn't take me longer than a half a day to help this person find housing. And I usually, uh, we were able to accomplish that within, by driving around town for at least a half a day, people usually got a good sense of where they wanted to go and they made contacts. And uh, I can remember the shortest period of time, we had a candidate come in for the Management and Economics Library, I can't remember her name, but she told me what she wanted and we drove around and it took me an hour. And that was the short, and I told her, I said, that's the shortest period of time that I've ever been able to secure housing for somebody. All the way up to a maximum of a whole afternoon to a minimum of one hour. <laughs> what about the search for the AP people? Is that similar? Um, not really. It, okay. Well, it's, uh, we, the libraries does have search committee, uh, mean, that's have search, established search committees mm -hmm. for most of our administrative professional opening. Now, some of our lower level administrative jobs we've not had search committees for, but those search committees work similarly to what the faculty do. Uh, we, we advertise in, in appropriate sources. We uh, screen, the committee screens candidates. The old way, we used to do all the screening ourselves. Um, and uh, we would invite people in on campus and interview them and then make decisions accordingly. But now the employment process has shifted on this campus in recent years. The, all clerical and service hiring and all administrative professional hiring is coordinated through uh, the university's Taleo system, which is run by the uh, Human Resource Services Division, the employment section of the Human Resource D Services Division. It's a computerized applicant retrieval system whereby all applicants for administrative professional jobs, uh, all non-faculty, non-student positions have to apply and get their credentials on file in that system and then that system is responsible for gathering all the EEO data that's required, doing the pre-screening that is required, and then getting these candidates ready to be referred to the various departments on campus. And my office, Carolyn Dexter and I and Michelle Conwell now, have access to the Taleo system and we can provide access to others too. For example, Nancy Hewison has current uh, access to the Taleo system. Donna Ferrillo on some of her searches has had access to the Taleo system. It's a very easy, simple system to use and it's, it's a lot more convenient than having to make hundreds and hundreds of copies of credentials when you can go to them and they're all online. Yeah. It's an online system and I love it. I absolutely sure. love it. Right. Um, did you, were you involved in the reference check, uh, would you do some reference checking too as well? I have done, um, okay, or did members of the search committee? Typ typically, uh, the responsibility for faculty searches, right. the, for reference checks, usually was vested with the chair of the committee and or he or she could participate in that and or delegate it to other members of the search committee. But reference, uh, it's a Purdue policy that reference checks have to be conducted on really anybody who who we want to consider for hiring here, whether they're faculty, administrative professional, or even clerical or service, now not, not students. But uh, the chairs of the search committees would typically do the reference, reference right. checks. Okay. Um, how is the advertising, it's, it's sort of online now, it's a little bit easier than <coughs> before. The thing, the thing I've found, yes. Uh, Sonny used to have to send those ads in. Yeah, you know, it used to, used to be we have to, we'd have to, I'd have to draft up an ad. Uh, then you have to send it down to free. Th aid. Then I used to have to send it down to Joanne Guntrup in purchasing, and Joanne Guntrup would have to approve it, make sure that it had all the EEO stuff on it. I, I would have to get the e, e, affirmative action office approval on that before I'd take it down there. She would keep type it into the computer. It would go into the computer overnight, and overnight the computer would generate a, uh, an order and then Joanne would either fax that purchase order or mail it to the location that we wanted to place the ad in. Typically I think she faxed them but uh, and that process was a kind of a gut-wrenching process because you had to you had to go through so many different you had to go through the before affirmative the action office. Yeah before the ad finally got placed you had to go through the affirmative action office which could take a day you had to get it through Joanne Gunter which could take a day or two or three I always told the library's administration, you have to give me a week's lead time to get all the paperwork done through all the appropriate channels to make the deadline date for the ad. And uh, so I had to always, I've always had to be very sensitive and, and knowledgeable about what deadline dates were for ads in order to make sure that we got all the paperwork down there. And we always did. We, I don't think we ever missed, I don't ever recall missing a deadline date. But then with the advent now of credit cards on campus, 
that whole process has changed to the point that I, my office is directly responsible for placing these ads directly online or faxing them. If it's a printed ad, we can fax them, and we just use our credit card. And I always make sure that we've got all the affirmative action stuff on it, and, and they've, they've vested that responsibility in me, and so they know that I'm not going to place any ads that have any squirrely wording in them or anything of that nature, um, that it's going to be pretty compliant with Purdue's EEO affirmative action sure. requirements. And it's, it's a lot simpler now to just be able to go online to whether it's ACRL, whether it's ALA, whether it's the, uh, the, Chronicle. the Chronicle of Higher Education. All of those, those organizations have online, both print and online <laughs> ads, webs, web, line, web ads, print ads, and online ads. And the costs differ uh, for each one of those different kinds of scenarios. But, um, and the advertising has become a lot more expensive over the years. Advertising in the Chronicle now is extremely expensive. And right. some of the other, I have to commend the library related uh, publications have ma managed to keep their prices down over the last 20 years compared to some place like the Chronicle or the New York Times. Uh, one of our librarians used to tell me I needed to advertise in the New York Times and about 20 years ago it cost many thousands of dollars to advertise in the New York Times and I just wouldn't do it. Well, you don't get. And they're you, we they're wouldn't. Not be look, they're, those ads are completely different. Yeah. Than we're yeah. For here. So, right. Who writes the letters for the candidates after the decision is made? Does I your do. Office My office them? does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you for, sign them as well? Yes. Yeah. For for faculty and administrative professional ones. Uh, well, for faculty, those the, 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 the as I affectionately refer, affect, refer to them as the ding letters, uh, or hold letters. Uh, we, I will I will send letters to applicants telling them that we're still in the applicant pool, but that. We're interviewing other candidates so that they know exactly what the status of their application is. And when they're finally, uh, when the job is filled, then I would send ding letters to all the, all the candidates. Now I do it via email. Many, in many respects, I do it via email. And that makes it a lot, much, lot simpler. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm old school. I, I prefer letters, formal letters. But everybody tell, even employment tells me, do it by email, Tom. Do it. That's the easy economical way to do it and so I guess I've succumbed to their desires one over the, the years. One of the things is there's always a lag, you know, sometimes and you have to really keep on top of it. A lot of places they don't hear for a long time. That's right. And uh, they get and then by the time you get around to it, I've already accepted another position. Yeah, I, and I, we've experienced that oh, too. Oh, everybody yeah. does. Yeah, and we've experienced that. Between a rock and a hard spot, I think I'm there. Um, American for Disabilities mm -hmm. Act. Uh, make a comment on that. The, that came yeah, on board. The eight, yeah, there, there have been major uh, legislation, uh, congressional legislation that has transpired over the last 20 years, and I can think of several of them. Uh, one of the most pronounced ones was the Americans with Disabilities Act, which I believe was came into being, well, it was long in coming, but I think it was finally approved and signed by the first President Bush, George Bush, back in the 19, was that been in the 1980s or 1990s? Um, and this was a, a, a movement across the country from a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of the organizations that deal with persons with disabilities and it was their intent was to, in, to mandate some kind of legislation that dealt with how people with disabilities were treated in the work environment and so the Americans with Disabilities Act came out in the 1990s and it basically said that employers have responsibilities to provide reasonable accommodations to qualified people with disabilities in order to ensure that they have the same equal employment opportunities as persons who are not disabled and it was a major uh, historical uh, piece of legislation and it has changed the outlook of the world of work tremendously. Now just in last year in uh, January, uh, in was it December of 2009, the second President Bush came out with a revised update to the Americans with Disabilities Act and it got through Congress and what that act basically did is to expand the definition of disability 
uh, the original Americans with Disabilities was maybe a little bit more restrictive in how they defined peop the definition of who a person with a disability was. This most recent 09 piece of legislation expanded it to incorporate a whole well raft of other uh, di uh, illnesses and disabilities that the first one did not include. So it's a major change and a major opening of of um, of the of the Americans with Disabilities Act. What was, what was one of the additions you recall? <coughs> one of the additions you recall? Um, it, it used to, it used to be that uh, people with high blood pressure or uh, people with with um, diabetes or uh, other kinds of s situations that people ha were taking medications for, what they call medi mitigating measures. If the person was was taking mitigating measures, then they typically were not considered to be persons with disabilities under the uh, original Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay. That's all changed. Now people that are have these disabilities and are taking mitigating me measures, for like for high blood pressure medicine or taking something for diabetes or he are taking some other kind of medication for a particular uh, situational health condition, they're basically considered to be qualified under the American with Disabilities Act. That's interesting. What yeah. other acts came on? Um, your the, the really big one, the one that impacted my office probably the most, was the Immigration Naturalization and Control Act of the 1980s. That was uh, prior to that time. We would hire uh, people and we would have them fill out a few forms, but with the uh, I, it's what they call the I-9 form now, the Immigration Naturalization Form I-9 that requires employers who hire people that they have to document the employment status of each and every person they, they hire. And to do that, you have to, the employee that's being hired has to provide the employer, which is us, with certain documents that prove that they're eligible to be hired. And those typically are some kind of a a picture ID like a driver's license or a Purdue ID and then some kind of uh, that establishes their identity and tells us that they are who they they are who they purport to be the second document is a little bit more stringent it has to be a document that says that these people are eligible to be employed which typically means a birth certificate or um, uh, a birth certificate or Oh, what else? There's another document. That's mostly we see birth certificates or other kinds of documents that says uh, that they are... Legal documents. Yeah. Sort of birth thing. certificate. Or, well, what's Not the baptismal. other one? I doubt that. Or passports many times. Right. Now, passports will, will not only provide, uh, and we deal with a lot of passports with international students, sure. and uh, international students have a whole set of different documents that they have to provide us. They have to provide us with the their passport with a picture on it and the proof that the pass we have to identify that the passport is not expired and that their picture is who they say they are then there's another document in the passport that shows that they've entered into this country legally it's called the I, I, I-94 form and then there's another form that typically Purdue University prepares it's called the I-20 that says they're in this country for a certain specified period of time and this is the source of their funding, how they're planned to be funded for the period of time that they're here at Purdue. Um, and both Carolyn Dexter and I and now Michelle Conwell have to be pretty knowledgeable about the different kinds of immigration documents, INS documents and all of that stuff and we have to keep up with all the changes in, in the immigration and naturalization laws as it applies to the, uh, to the I-9 rules and regulations. And they've gotten, they're getting a little more stringent with that in the wake of September 11th and all this stuff, the INS has tightened down and, and uh, Purdue has in like fashion tightened down on the paperwork, the paper flow and how the, that some people are not going to be put on the paper, on the payroll until those documents are actually on file down in Freehafer Hall. So we've, we have to really hustle to, to make sure that we get all the right documentation. A lot more records you have to have. A lot right. more records, yeah. yeah. Right. So we have the, uh, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, and then under uh, President Clinton we had the Family Medical Leave Act. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a large act that basically says that employers of over 25 
uh, employees are legally obligated to provide a maximum of 12 weeks of leave entitlement to their employees for their own either their own personal illness, illness in the immediate family, uh, to for the birth or adoption of a child, uh, and those are the primary reasons why employers are required to grant uh, the, the the 12 weeks of family medical leave. Now these are these are 12 weeks that are unpaid. The family medical leave does not provide any additional monies or funding for this. It has to come out of the employee or produce sick leave benefits or their vacation, but we are required to provide the, the 12 weeks off to people who prove that they have a legitimate family medical leave reason. And workers, comp workers compensation, when we have workers comp claims and people injure themselves, they're also on family medical leave too. It's all part and parcel of the same leave. And then in addition to the family medical leave, Purdue has adopted recent, in the re last recent year or so, the paid parental leave, which provides paid leave to parents of newborns or newly adopted uh, dependents. And we've been granting more and more of those kinds of, of leave. And those, <coughs> excuse me, those are an additional benefit because Purdue pays the cost of that. The leave comes out of the university payroll, uh, and so people are in a in a paid status. So, uh, what's the length on that? The length is uh, for the employee who uh, for the female employee who is um, uh, going to have the baby. It's 240 hours for uh, that's six weeks of paid parental leave following the birth of the baby. For the uh, spouse of the of the person. It's 120 hours, which is the equivalent of three weeks. So, like for the for the mother, it would be 240 hours, and for the father, if the father worked here at Purdue, he would be eligible for 120 hours of paid parental leave following the birth of the child, and that's all legally mandated. And we've been granting several of those in in the re last sure. year or so. Another so type of leave that you still have, you don't hear so much, about, is the military leave that they get called up. Yeah, well, I've not, you know, I've, the only, Lucy Allen was the only one that ever got called I up for military I leave. Recall. I've not had any uh, military leaves in a long time. Um, the university forms that we have have that on there, sure. and, and uh, uh, there also was a new leave provision for granting family medical leave to um, individuals who had relatives in the military. There, there's a new leave provision out that I'm not totally, I haven't had that situation sure, yet, so I'm right. not totally uh, knowledgeable about that, but, but there, there's another, another addition to the military leave that has to do, I think it has to do with family, if you have a, a family member that was injured in the course of their military duty, you can grant them family medical leave to take care of their military sure. okay. uh, dependent. Right. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you about mediation, uh, counseling people if they're trying to get into uh, some of the employment <coughs> problems. Mm -hmm. or, um, um, I, I've over the years I've counseled in my responsibility with employee relations. I've talked to a lot of employees. Uh, right. I told that we've talked about university policies, and uh, the university has policies and procedures on constructive employee discipline. They also have certified mediation experts on campus. Now I have been to some mediation training, but I am never I was never a certified mediation expert, even though I've been through I've been through the been okay. through the, the experiences over the years. But sure. but there are trained mediation experts on campus and when we find situations that that are just almost impassable then I have on occasion called Free Hay for Hall and talked to some of the employee relations people and ask for their guidance and advice and assistance in some of the mediation efforts that we've tried to do here in the library. We've not had a lot of that. We've had just a few. Um, and I'm very, like I say, I'm very pleased to say that in the 30 some odd years that I've been here, we've only had one grievance that ever went uh, outside, of the, outside of the libraries and that was like maybe seven or eight years ago. And this individual took it all the way to the United States Supreme Court and lost it. Um, but that was the only one grievance that I can think of that really got out of the libraries. Any other 
uh, employee relations issues that we've had, we've always been able to settle in a positive fashion internally within our own organization. You also handle the exit interviews, don't you, for the clerical service? Yeah, yeah, I do. do you I do, do it for AP as well? Uh, yeah, I have, yes. I do, ex I send, f I, it's, it, I, I've, in recent years I've left, left it up to be a voluntary thing and because I never want to, it, it's the way it's always supposed to be. Sure. Um, we send forms to departing employees asking them to fill out the forms and then ask them if they want to schedule a meeting with me to discuss it and all of those discussions are in confidence and I, I tell them that it's in confidence but I say if I'm ever asked by the Dean of Libraries or any kind of a question that I will always answer truthfully to the Dean of Library to the, but outside of that those, those, that, those conversations go they don't go anywhere and the forms have stayed in a locked de in my desk locked over the last 30 some odd years um, I, I, I've heard the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, it's mostly been good. It's not really ever been all that bad, and it's never really been, except in maybe a couple instances, only ugly. But most of it has been good. This library organization has a reputation for treating their people well, for providing work opportunities that are rewarding to people that they feel comfortable in, they enjoy the people that they work with, their colleagues. They may not always agree with the management of this organization and some of the decisions that are made, but generally speaking, I have had for the last 30 some odd years nothing but positive comments about this organization and the people that work here and the work that's done. If, any, if there's any consistency in anything negative, it was always that the salaries were too low. But that I have to compliment former Dean Mobley and also Dean Jim James Mullins, they made major inroads in improving the wage situation for the support staff in this organization. And Jim did that the minute he stepped in the door, and Emily did it also. And between the two of them, I'm always very glad to say that the Purdue Libraries is no longer at the bottom rung of the ladder. Yeah. I'm not sure where we are right now, but, but we're no longer at the bottom. And uh, thanks to their efforts and their generosity that that the library staff and I'm not sure that they ever were thanked for their efforts for that I'm not even so sure that the that the library staff were aware that I'm sure they're aware it's done but but nobody ever really thanked Emily Mobley or Jim Mo I did I did personally but that was just me yeah, okay. Thank you. <coughs> uh, the liaison with the University of Human Resources Mm -hmm. uh, and to tell about just any comment, you, well, you, were, you list the jobs are listed. So. Since, yeah, since I, I, my, I originally came from Human Resources, so my, my ties are back into that department. So uh, over the last 30 some odd years, when it came to employment matters or issues, we worked, Carolyn Dexter and I and Michelle now, work very closely with the employment people down there, many of whom I've talked with on the phone and I've never met them. Uh, also, the, uh, the uh, employee relations people, Connie Rakowski and Sharon Williams and Tom Gantz, who's retired now, and Mike Dreher, who's retired, and all those people. Uh, we worked pretty closely with them on, on employee relations issues, trying to get them resolved. Uh, the compensation people, Deb Turner down there now, it used to be Chip Goldsbury and Donna Dye. We worked very closely with them on job descriptions and job classifications and job surveys. They contact us when they're trying to do surveys of, they, they report on a lot of surveys and when they have library related jobs that they don't know anything about, they'll call me up and say, I've got this job description, Tom, can you tell me who best fits in this in your organization? And I'll either tell them it's a fit or it isn't a fit. And um, It's always surveys. It's always surveys. And we, and, and we participate in surveys too. So we, uh, my office works very closely with, with the central HR offices, and we've always established a good uh, rapport and reputation with them. They enjoy working with us, and we enjoy working with them. So it works out okay. Any uh, committees that you served on in the libraries? Um, oh, yeah. I was on the library's okay. management team. I'm on okay. the infrastructure team. Back when I first came here, we had PSAC, Personnel Services Advisory Committee. All right. Um, I was the one many years ago, not so much in recent years, but many years ago, I was the one that kept uh, LCSAC going and meeting. Um, that was long before LAPSAC came into being. 
I remember the director of the library said, gave me the responsibility for kind of coordinating the activities of LCSAC, and that changed when Emily Mobley came in. She wanted LCSAC reporting directly to her, and which I thought was an excellent, sure. excellent suggestion, and that it's continued in that vein ever since, since uh, that time. Um, lots of, uh, oh yeah, lots of, all the faculty search committee meetings. Right. I've served on. Uh, there was a uni I've served on university task forces on um, paid time off. I never will forget. We had a university task force many years ago that they were contemplating the concept of doing away with vacation and sick leave and just giving everybody a, a lump of time that they call paid time off. Many colleges and universities have that. We don't have that here at Purdue. We still have certain vacation credits and sick leave credits and holiday credits and Purdue tends to still keep them in their little little compartments, whereas many other educational institutions just throw them all together and say, here, you can take pay, paid time off if you're sick, if you're on vacation for a holiday, you can do whatever you want to do. And uh, I remember being on that committee and it, that didn't fly. Um, I've also been on university committees where they were talking about shutting down the organization during the Christmas holidays then that fell flat on its face many years ago, but I think they're still resurrecting that idea and it may, may come into being. The major problem at that time was a lot of the research activities that were going on, you just couldn't shut off, you couldn't, you couldn't shut you're off. Still, you're always going to have that. Yeah, you yeah, cannot. yeah. Right. For example, I think the example that I was given was over in Herrick Labs, if they have an engine over there that they've been testing that engine and been running it continuously for 10 years, you just cannot flip the off switch and then turn it back on three days later because right, exactly. there, there goes your research. That's right, and right. I remember I remember distinctly that particular experiment. And that's uh, yeah. true, too. And that's you know. true. Oh, yeah, right. But, yeah, lots, lots of search committees and university committees. And uh, I'm right now I'm on the University Ergonomics Committee. We meet once a month out of Purdue West. I serve in that capacity. I've been on... Uh, I've been on University Affirmative Action Liaison Committees for, like, 15, 20 years when Paul Bayless was here. I represented the libraries and CIS and academic services on that university committee, and Quite but not so much anymore. Right. Uh, library directors, now, when you came, uh, Joe Dagnese was the yeah. director? Yeah. Okay. When and I came... Comments, then you had Emily and... Yeah, and was, I came under Joe Dagnese. When I came here, Joe Dagnese was director. Keith Dowden was an assistant director. Dave Moses was an assistant director. Uh, Mimi Drake was an assistant director. I'm, am I forgetting anybody? I think that was all we had. All we had right. And then, uh, and then Joe Dinesi passed on. And before he did, though, he hired Emily Mobley as his assistant director. I remember that. And then when Joe passed away, the library's faculty made a move and made a, made a recommendation to the, I suppose, the provost at the time, to promote Emily into being. Are the library's first dean, dean of libraries. So Emily Mobley was made uh, dean of li she was our first dean of libraries, and then she worked in that capacity for what over well over ten years, right. and then she retired, and Dean Mullins has, has been on board now. And I have to say, I could not ask for any better have worked for any better people than Joe Dinesi, Emily Mobley, and Jim Mullins. They were all eminently well qualified and well very professional librarians very uh in tune with their profession and wanting to uh improve the, the the work that's done here at the Purdue Library both in terms of the way we do things our physical facilities i've seen numerous physical changes in physical facilities in this organization and changing the organization to try to accommodate the needs of what professional libraries are doing these days and right. and, and those those three individuals have did a, have done a marvelous job good point okay um, do you participate in your alumni organization at Ball State at all uh, I'm a member of that okay. and I get their mailings and sure. I pay my dues but I don't I'm not an active there's not participant. a local section here probably no maybe no not. there didn't no. used to be for Purdue but now there is I know and I'm not a Purdue alumni but I do I do give to Purdue I give to the pet funds and and I do give donations because I'm, I'm a great believer in Purdue and what Purdue does and, and all that stuff. And I enjoy Purdue athletics. 
I'm not as active in it as I was several years ago, but I still I love athletics and I love Purdue football and I watch Purdue basketball. I used to go to the women's games. I had season. I haven't had season tickets here in about a year or two, but I still kind of miss that. And I love women's basketball. I love men's basketball, and I love men's football. As Katie knows, I, I we, we enjoy that. And those those are the, those are the kind of traditions yeah, yeah, that I really like. Yeah. How about a Purdue tradition? Do you have a, a Purdue tradition? Do I have a Purdue tradition? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe you just spoke a little bit about well, it. Well, maybe a little bit, but athletic, your athletics. Yeah, my my interest in Purdue yeah. athletics. Okay. And mm-hmm. went to the Rose Bowl. Went to the oh, Rose Bowl. I, I went to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, that was an experience. I absolutely and utterly enjoyed that experience. That on was your, fun. On your watch, you got we got to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about an outstanding event? Come to mind? <coughs> outstanding event. Hmm. There have been a few. Um, that I've been most. Imp- I can't think of any one in particular. I can remember when we opened the undergraduate library. Okay. I thought that that it doesn't we made, have to be a Purdue event. Yeah. Any event, right? Oh, an yeah. outstanding event. At any event. Sure. Um, oh boy. They've all been out. They've all been memorable. There've been lots of mem- memorable right. experiences with people and celebrations, and uh, I can't think of any one. The that, birth. How that, about? Uh, the time we all got together for Emily's birthday and we put the birthday oh. on the jumbotron oh. and also oh, yeah. the uh, Joe Dagnese with the birthday yeah. with the plane the, yes yes, yes. I've, I've, those yeah yeah we uh, when Joe Dagnese turned 60 we uh, we hired a plane to fly over the ross Aid Stadium to, to say happy birthday Joe happy 60th birthday Joe I don't think he was pleased with that at all but I think he he really deep down appreciated it. and we did the same thing for Emily Mobley was that for her 60th and the one, the one thing I do, uh, another memorable event thing, and I can't remember if it was for her 60th birthday, was my office and the administrative offices hired a limousine, a stretch limousine, and we took Emily out the back door and put her in that stretch limousine, and we took her over to the uh, Triple X or the Dog and Suds. We had a, a, a stretch limo, take her out to the Dog and Suds on the east side of town where we had a group of people out there, a little party going on, and she was absolutely floored with that. She absolutely loved that stretch limo. In fact, I remember after it was over with, we had it for like another hour. She she told him, she said she's going to drive around a little bit. She absolutely loved that, and I never will. That was one of the funniest, funniest, most humorous, most fun uh, lunches I've ever had, and uh, and I never will forget that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, now we're down to the bottom. The next stage, 2010 mm. and beyond. Yeah, I've got... And, I'll, and then the closing thing, yeah. I'll leave up to you. Yeah, I've got two and a half more weeks here, and I'm in the process of cleaning out. I've got my desk pretty well cleaned out. Now Michelle and I, in the next week or two, are going to have to clean out some files, 30 years of, of files that need to be gone through. Some of them I'll put in the attic. Most of them I will probably pitch, and I have attic file. I've got about 15, 15 filing cabinets full of files upstairs in the attic that... Most of them can be purged. Um, but then once I get gone, I plan to just relax for a week or so. I've got some projects at home, lots of painting projects that I want to get done. Uh, hopefully when the weather gets better, I've got a lot of yard projects that I want to get done. Um, uh, you going to take any trips? I'm planning. I was tentatively planning trips. I've got friends down in, uh, in down around uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, that keep begging me to come down. I've got, I just got an email from my ex-college roommate, Ball State roommate. He's down in Nashville, Tennessee. His son is a, his son was, uh, was in a, a, a group called BR459 that was a quasi-popular country western group several years ago. I don't think they're that popular nowadays, but his son now has a, a country and western recording studio down there in Nashville, Tennessee. And my college roommate, Jim McDowell, and his wife sold their home here on the west west side, uh, and moved down to Nashville. They were living in this town. They were living, oh. yeah, and they moved down to Nashville to be close to their son and his wife and their new grandson. So they've invited me to come down. In fact, I just got an email from him today. He can't make it to my retirement, but he said, "Come on down." So I may go down and visit them. I've also got uh, relatives out in uh, San Francisco that keeps telling me that I need to come out and visit them. I've been to San Francisco before, and but never to this house that they're in now. And I've got old college friends that 
that are married and living in Seattle and that keep saying, I need to come out and visit them. So I've got no scarcity of places to go. <laughs> it's just simply a matter of getting on a plane and going and deciding to go. Deciding where to go where first. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then, then ultimately, I don't know, either in the summer or maybe in the fall, I, I'm not the kind of person that can just sit around and do nothing. I'm thinking about going out and looking for a part-time job. At, I keep telling people I want to get a part-time job stocking shelves at Lowe's or Menards. That would suit me absolutely fine. <laughs> get a minimum wage job. Minimum wage is now up to seven dollars and what twenty-five cents. My God, that's fourteen thousand bucks a year. If you worked half time, that's seven thousand bucks. If I worked half time, that'd be enough to pay all my medical insurance premiums. <laughs> that's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah. And that's all I need because, as of let's see, today's Wednesday, isn't it? Today, this is the the day is the the anniversary of my second Social Security check. My second Social Security check is supposed to be deposited today. I haven't checked yet. First one I got last in January. The second one is supposed to be the second Wednesday of February. So I'm open. I'm hoping that I'm a little bit richer today because of my Social Security <laughs> check being deposited. We'll see. Yeah. In closing, any comment? Is something that I didn't ask or? No, you've. I can't believe you covered the gamma. You got everything from the from the cradle to the grave, and that's beautiful. You you did a marvelous job, yeah. and thank you. And I appreciate your taking the time to do this. I've absolutely and utterly, I've told everybody this, absolutely and utterly adored working for the Purdue Libraries and working with all these people. It, you're on the cutting edge of, of information technology and you're right up there. You know what's going on. You're probably more in tune with what's going on on this campus than anywhere else. If I was still working down at Freehafer Hall, I would have no, no idea what's going on on this campus because they are so far physically removed I just love this place, and it was the best move I ever made. And I, I congratulate whoever succeeds me in coming into this position because whoever, because they will, I hopefully they'll find it just as challenging and as rewarding and as fulfilling as I did. Thank you, Tom. I okay. appreciate that. Thanks very much.